the cloud. Oh yes. All right. I say, I say, got it. Where's my, where is my? <laughs> come on, needle. There you go. Okay, there you got, got it. it. All right. Yeah. So, um, welcome everybody to um, Peter White Public Library. For people who are watching tonight and for people who are watching after the fact, um, my name is Marty Ackett and I'm the adult programming coordinator for the library. And, um, and, and I'm so excited to be able to welcome Craig Dudnick back um, to the library for Martin Luther King Day to talk about his um, really wonderful documentary, which I have seen, Craig. I, I watched it last week. I loved it. Thank you um, so much. Um, Evanston's Living History. Um, but let me just uh, go over a few things that are coming up um, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, on Wednesday, we have our um, All Booked Up book club where we go down TV6 and we talk about um, uh, uh, the, the month's book, which is Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. And then we go to the crossroads and we have lunch, we drink and we talk about it some more. So it's even better. Um, and then on... Um, on a, um, Friday, we are we have our global cinema matinee at 12 p.m. in the community room, and um, this month we are showing Florian Henkel von Donnersmark's *The Lives of Others*, um, which was a 2006 Oscar winner for best foreign language film, and it uh, depicts the um, uh, political and erotic intrigue in Cold War East Berlin. It's a really fantastic film. And then um, next week, uh, Wednesday, we have the Wallens in concert. Um, you don't want to miss that. They're a really wonderful um, bluegrass uh, uh, folk group. And they're going to be at the in the community room at um, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 25th. So let me tell you a little bit about Craig. We've been talking like for a half an hour already before we got started here. Um, Craig is a 1980 graduate of North Northwestern University, um, and um, in 1982, he received a national award for his camera work on the syndicated um, television program, PM Magazine. Um, and then he founded his um, Imagine Video Productions the following year um, and um, gained clients from all across the world, Europe, Japan, and ABC News. Um, let's see. Um, uh, let, um, so uh, fellow, I'm, I'm just going through this. Uh, there's so much here, Craig, that I can right. talk Feel about. Feel free to edit, please. <laughs> Feel free to edit. I, 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 I just want to read the whole thing, but I think I'm going to leave that up to you. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, uh, let's see. While an undergraduate at Northwestern, Craig grew close to um, uh, uh, a woman named Miss Viola Hillsman and her husband, Tinsley, um, with whom he worked at a um, kitchen in the kitchen of the campus uh, fraternity and um, his lifelong friendship with the couple was the subject of a feature on NPR program um, called The Story of Dick Gordon. And um, after um, Ms. Hill Mrs. Hillman passed away at 100, a number of her friends shared personal accounts of their struggles against racism in Evanston, Illinois. And that became the basic basis for um, the documentary that Craig's gonna be talking about tonight, Evanston's Living History. Um, so um, I'm going, and if you haven't seen it, both of these films are on um, Canopy, uh, Alice's Ordinary People, which we saw last year and is really wonderful. I really encourage you to go out and so see that one as well. Um, but the movie that we're going to be talking about tonight is Evanston's Living History. So I'm going to turn things over to Craig, and um, I'm really looking forward to tonight, Craig. Oh, thank you, Martin. It's an honor to be back at your library. Um, and especially on this date, uh, Dr. King's birthday. Um, so when you mentioned Mrs. Hillsman, that was my friend. And after she died at age 100, um, I started to try to figure out, how, you know, a film that I could make about the African-American community. And I thought it was going to be people reminiscing. But her good friend was a woman that I knew as Mrs. Annabelle Frazier. And it's odd because I would always run into her and it became like a running joke. <laughs> I would always see her and she would always kid me, you know, you're getting so fat eating Mrs. Hillsman's things like that. And so when I went to make the film, it turns out that Mrs. Frazier's grandfather, her full name was Annabelle Crawford Frazier. And her grandfather was a man named Anthony Crawford. And that's where our film starts and his life story, her grandfather's life story, if you trace it, is a big part of American history. And I'm going to take you through 
actually the period after the Civil War through his life, and then the history surrounding that. Um, and I think you might have a different insight on that on that period. And the sort of the ordinary, if I can use that word, ordinary people struggle for civil rights. And that's what happens following the great migration north to Evanston and how uh, those once refugees become community leaders and forming what Dr. King called the beloved community. That, that effort to make a community built on justice, uh, a community at peace with itself, that being the goal. Um, so let's start uh, Mr. Crawford's story. So Mr. Crawford is born 1860, January of 1865 in Abbeville, South Carolina. So Abby, uh, Mr. Crawford is owned by Ben and Rebecca Crawford. He is one of 20,000 enslaved people in the Abbeville area. Uh, Abbeville is also the home and birthplace of John C. Calhoun the former vice president, the architect of secession. The historian Eric Foner once described Calhoun as the number one propagandist in the United States for slavery and racial inferiority before the Civil War. Now, November 22nd, 1860, there's a meeting held in Abbeville and there the decision is made that South Carolina will secede. And a month later, South Carolina becomes the first state to secede from the Union, setting off the Civil War. May 2nd, 1865, Jefferson Davis is fleeing Richmond. He stops off in Abbeville, and that's where the meeting is held and the decision made to end the Confederacy. So Abbeville happens to be where the American Civil War started and ended. Now, December of 1865, Congress ratified the 13th Amendment, freeing the hundreds of thousands of enslaved people not, not covered by the Emancipation Proclamation. It also abrogated state treaties that allowed for slavery. Now, it's almost impossible for us to imagine being enslaved or going from slavery to freedom. We have Harriet Tubman's description of her first morning in freedom. She said, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came up like gold through the trees, and I felt like I was in heaven. But how free were the freed people? On the eve of the Civil War, we had the infamous Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court that said that Black people were not citizens of the United States with no rights that white people were bound to respect. Now we move to November of 1863 at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where President Lincoln gave what the program of the day listed as remarks, but would later be known as the Gettysburg Address. Lincoln is wearing the mourning band on his hat for his son, Willie, who died a year earlier of typhoid fever, a death that will devastate his family. But on this day, he's, tried, he's going to try to give meaning to a catastrophic, horrific civil war that would claim 700,000 lives back when our country had 32 million people. So Lincoln starts his speech. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth to this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Lincoln's speech, warmly received, interrupted five times by applause, but not everyone thought highly of it. Uh, the Chicago Times newspaper wrote, it was to uphold this constitution and the union created by it that our officers and soldiers gave their lives at Gettysburg. How dare he, meaning Lincoln, then standing on their graves, mistake the cause for which they died and libel the statesmen who founded the government. The Times had a point in that the Constitution never spoke about equality. Four score and seven years went back to the Declaration of Independence. But in 1868, Congress ratified the 14th Amendment, which said that Black people were citizens of the United States and that all citizens were entitled to equal protection under the law. And then in 1870, they ratified the 15th Amendment that said that no citizen could be denied the right to vote because of race. And with the amended constitution came a reconstruction of democracy, what some have called the second founding of the Republic. And no state created more legislation to improve the lives of freedmen than South Carolina. 
South Carolina was majority black. It had the greatest concentration of black people of any state, 60%. It had the only majority black state legislature. And they gave South Carolina its first system of publicly funded schools. It also created a program unique to South Carolina, the South Carolina Land Commission, which enabled freedmen to buy land cheaply. And this would affect some one in seven black families in South Carolina, some 14,000 black families the heirs to the Samuel Marshall plantation in Abbeville, a uh, white plantation sold their 2,700 acre tract to the South Carolina Land Commission for $10 an acre in 1869. And they divide that land into roughly 50 plots of 50 acres. And by 1872, some 42 black families in Abbeville will have purchased plots on this land, which will be called promised land, the community named on the idea of the promise to repay the note. But the name had a deeper significance uh, about promised land. So we think it's very likely that Anthony Crawford's father acquired his land uh, through this promised land community. Now, Anthony Crawford was a gifted student. He walked 14 miles round trip to school each day. Um, his generation uh, uh, felt greatly removed from the earlier uh, slave generations with economic, educational, and political opportunities that would have been unthinkable in earlier years. But in 1876, there was a deadlock presidential election between the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and the Democrat Samuel Tilden. So they, they make a deal. Uh, the Republican Hayes will get the office, but in return, federal troops will be removed from the South, ending Reconstruction. And the last states to have federal troops are Louisiana and South Carolina. Although political power will still be shared for one more generation between blacks and whites in South Carolina. In 1892, Anthony Crawford's father died and Anthony Crawford inherited his land. He was one of nine children, but he was the only child who could sign his name. So he inherited the land. And it turned out that he was a gifted farmer. He turned that land into 427 acres of prime cotton land. Anthony Crawford lent money to his white neighbors. He took part in parades. He was a prominent member of the community. Uh, he served on a federal jury. He had a school on his land for African-American children. He was a deacon in his church. He was a Mason. He started a union for black farmers. Anthony Crawford was the wealthiest black farmer in Abbeville and one of the wealthiest black farmers in South Carolina worth $20,000. Now we go to 1895 and the state legislature in South Carolina following the lead of the state legislature in Mississippi disenfranchised black people. They didn't do it by race because that would have violated the 15th amendment. They did it through poll tax and literacy tests. And it was very effective from 1900 to 1970. There were no blacks elected to public office in South Carolina. Then in 1896, we had the United States Supreme Court getting behind segregation with the Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal decision. One judge opposed, Judge Harlan. He was a southerner, his father had owned slaves. But Judge Harlan said that this decision violated the 14th Amendment and would go down as another Dred Scott decision. And a half century later, he was proven correct. But in the meantime, Plessy versus Ferguson had the effect of segregating nearly all aspects of life in the South, severely degrading black schools, giving the best opportunity to whites, and on the fringes of society, the Ku Klux Klan and lynching to enforce the new system known as Jim Crow. Now we go to February of 1898, Lake City, South Carolina, about 150 miles east of Abbeville, a black postal official by the name of Fraser Baker is lynched. Ida B. Wells, an activist and journalist then living in Chicago, went to the White House to visit a President McKinley and to argue for anti-lynching legislation because Fraser Baker is a federal employee appointed by McKinley. Uh, McKinley's parents were abolitionists, so he's not unsympathetic, and he promises a full investigation, uh, but the fight for anti-lynching legislation will get no further than the Southern legislators, particularly the Southern senators. Now we go to October 21st, 1916. It's a Saturday. 
Anthony Crawford goes down to the square in Abbeville to sell his cotton. He, um, the, he gets in line with the other, uh, with the white farmers, and the price of cotton starts to drop. So he's told to get out of line and let the white farmers get the higher price. And he refused. He said, my cotton is every bit as good as theirs. This leads to an altercation that leads to his lynching. He was stoned, he was stabbed, his body drugged through the streets, carried out to the fairgrounds where he's hung from a tree and riddled with bullets. Crawford's last words were, give my bank to my children and I thought I was a good citizen. Uh, citizens of uh, the white citizens of Abbeville take out an ad in a paper saying that the Crawford family has to quit the state of South Carolina. Crawford's son, uh, with a crop still in the field, appeals, writes to the governor for help. Governor Manning is considered a moderate, but he writes back, though he deplores lynching, he cannot protect the family. So they gather their belongings and head, head migrate north to start over again, penniless in Evanston, Illinois, and they wrap the little grandbaby in newspaper to protect her. And that little grandbaby was the woman I knew as uh, Miss a Mrs. Uh, Annabelle Frazier, the, the friend of Mrs. Hillsman. Sometimes this history is so close to us, but we'll, we will never know it. So now the, uh, within the next 10 years, half the black population of, of Abbeville will also leave fleeing the terror, terrorism of lynching and to find uh, more work uh, in the factories up north. And they become the core of the African-American community in Evanston, Illinois, this group from Abbeville. Uh, but they soon find out that the north has its own version of Jim Crow. The Reverend Leonidas Brownlee was a 46-year-old black pastor with a wife and five children at the Church of God in Evanston. He's originally from South Carolina. On December 31st, 1922, Reverend Brownlee has a burst appendix. Uh, Dr. Penn is the black doctor in Evanston uh, who has a clinic for black people out of his home. But Reverend Brownlee needs an ambulance, but ambulances in Evanston do not carry black people. Reverend Brownlee needs to go to a hospital but Evanston hospitals do not allow black patients. So instead, Reverend Brownlee takes the two hour cab ride to Cook County Hospital in Chicago, where the doctor says that had he arrived 15 minutes earlier, he could have saved his life. Instead, the body is carried out to Sunset, which is the black cemetery well outside of Evanston. Edwin Jordan is a black graduate of Harvard University, born 1900 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, his parents, uh, uh, two generations of his family, several generations actually had been involved in the fight for civil rights. His father was one of the founders of the Niagara movement, the forerunner of the NAACP. Well, it turns out that Jordan is a talented writer. He um, very much respects the work of the Chicago Defender, and he wants to follow his career in journalism following in the traditional tradition of the Defender. So he goes to Evanston to get a graduate degree at, at, uh, in journalism at Northwestern University. And eventually he will become the managing editor of the B newspaper, a black Chicago newspaper. Now, one aspect of the great migration, uh, when the group comes to Chicago, they come to um, an existing area where a segregated area of Chicago where blacks are forced to live. Initially, uh, this does not exist in Evanston, but they create it in, in Evanston's fifth ward. And what they hadn't planned on was the political power that this would create by segregating people into one ward. Uh, so they gerrymander the ward, try to divide it in half, separating black people from two of their most important institutions, their churches. So when Jordan saw what was happening, he wrote a letter to the editor of the Evanston newspaper uh, talking about the unfairness of dividing the black community. And then he spoke to the black community in what was then called Foster Auditorium and they convinced him to run for alderman. Now this is 1931. Um, and I, I will say this too, that back in New Bedford, 
uh, black served on the fire department, the police department, black people taught school, black people could live anywhere they wanted. None of this was true in Evanston at that time. Um, so in a Marion, Indiana, just to give you a, more of a sense of the climate of the time, that's 90 miles from Evanston. The lynching of two young black men in Marion, their bodies uh, dangling from a tree, produced a photograph that inspires the song Strange Fruit that Billie Holiday sang. But now Evanston also has a progressive side. Evanston is the home of Francis Willard, the longtime president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The Women's Christian Temperance Union is the largest women's organization of the 19th century with hundreds of thousands of members. With temperance, they find the issue that galvanized women, the men coming home drunk, abusing the wife, destroying the family. She was so few rights, but they also stood for an eight hour workday, an end to child labor and women's suffrage. And though Frances Willard died in 1898, many of the causes that she and her organization fought for would become law in the 20th century, including the 18th Amendment prohibition and the 19th Amendment women's suffrage. So Jordan wins his aldermanic election, but it doesn't take long for the white power structure to swing into action. It seems they found a discrepancy in some 37 votes, which would not have affected the outcome. We know about it because it was written up by W.E.B. Du Bois in the Crisis Magazine, which is the official publication of the NAACP. And though the city council uh, was quick to clear Jordan of any wrongdoing, uh, in a midnight phone call that, that uh, Du Bois said made a joke out of justice, they called Jordan to inform him that they had decided that he was no longer the alderman. Uh, but this is the um, response that Jordan had. And it gives you a sense of, of his eloquence. So Jordan said that the fact that they had chosen to exempt me personally is something for which I should be appreciative. Yet I cannot help but call to mind the words of Edmund Burke. You cannot indict a whole people. I intend to show in the next election that there was no fraud. So he's going to run again. Now, at that time, Evanston had two aldermen from each ward, a two-year term and a one-year term. He would have had an easier time if he'd gone for the one-year term, but he decides to make the fight for the two-year term. And for the one-year term, for the first time, a white woman will will run for alderman. Miss Daisy Sandage, originally from Texas, she's the former vice president of the League of Women Voters in Evanston. And even a, a, a section of the white community uh, was outraged at what had been done to Jordan. So this election becomes almost a cause celeb. W.E.B. Du Bois kicks off his campaign with a speech. Uh, Oscar de Priest, who's the first black congressman elected since Reconstruction, uh, spoke for him, as did Clarence Darrow, the most famous attorney in America. Darrow's speech drew thousands. DePriest knew well what Jordan was going through. He had been Chicago's first black alderman, and there were charges trumped up against him as well, and it took Clarence Darrow to clear his name. Northwestern students stood up in line all night at City Hall, including some famous faculty and all-American athletes, so that Jordan's name would appear first on a ballot. Uh, they were fortified with food and coffee from the Black women of Evanston who stayed up all night with them. Uh, Jordan always credited the Black women of Evanston for all that he was able to accomplish. And it turns out that the students needed the All-American athletes to run interference because there was quite a physical altercation at City Hall. But the students prevailed. Jordan's name appeared first on the ballot, and this time Jordan won by a wider margin than the first time. Uh, to become the first black alderman in, in Evanston. Uh, and it was in newspaper headlines all across the country. Black man wins aldermanic election in Evanston, Illinois. As Rose Jordan, his daughter pointed out, the black community was no longer just over there. The white power structure had to respect their votes and deliver on the promises that they made. And Jordan set about uh, fighting the most uh, uh, overt racism, desegregating the beaches, desegregating the theaters and desegregating the city parks. Edwin Jourdain was mentored by Charles Hamilton Houston. Charles Hamilton Houston was a black graduate of Harvard University Law School, a World War I veteran. He got the Howard Law School accredited. 
And in that early graduating class, Oliver Hill and Thurgood Marshall, it's Charles Hamilton Houston that devises the strategy of fighting, using the legal process, fighting through the Supreme Court rather than Congress for civil rights, because Congress is hamstrung by the Southern senators. And though Charles Hamilton Houston died in 1950, his strategy bore fruit in 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education landmark Supreme Court ruling, uh, ending separate but equal, upholding the 14th Amendment and desegregating the schools. Now, returning uh, Black veterans from World War II come home with renewed determination to fight for freedom. Uh, veteran Sanders Hicks, a direct descendant of Anthony Crawford's, becomes Evanston's first Black firefighter in 1950, but he can't eat with the other fighter, firefighters' separate silverware. Bill Logan, a Korean War veteran, uh, also a direct descendant of Anthony Crawford's, is an early Black police officer in Evanston. Uh, but he talks about having going into the white community and having doors slammed in his face and that blacks are never promoted. Then Bill Logan got assigned to guard Dr. Martin Luther King when he came to Evanston. And initially Dr. King was not allowed to stay in the white hotel, which in the language of the day did not accommodate Negro guests. Instead, Dr. King stayed in the basement of the Beth Emmett synagogue who had invited him. But Bill told Dr. Bill Logan told Dr. King about his wanting to quit the police department because of the racism. And, but Dr. King had this advice for him: never give up on your dream. But nobody's going to give you anything. You've got to be prepared. And Bill took that advice to heart and took all the cl extra classes that he could find offered by the department, local colleges, Midwestern colleges. He becomes Evanston's first black police sergeant in 1965. He rises through the ranks and in the 70s then becomes a candidate for the chief's position. And they changed the rule. Now you have to have a college degree, but Bill had it because of Dr. King's advice to become our first African-American chief of police in Evanston. Those once refugees were becoming community leaders. Uh, Lorraine Morton from North Carolina became the first black school teacher to teach in a white school, first black principal alderman, and then Evanston's first and only black mayor. And though she has since passed, she's still the longest serving mayor in Evanston history. And the pla pastors play their part, none more so than the Reverend Jacob Blake and the fight for open housing. But there's another aspect of what Dr. King called the beloved community, a community at peace with itself, a community built on justice. Uh, back in Abbeville, Anthony Crawford had a school on his land for African-American children. His descendant, the firefighter, then later fire chief, Sanders Hicks, starts the Evanston Speed Skating Club. And one of those who signs up is a young boy with a single mother, Shawnee Davis. Shawnee's talented. His mother has Sanders directly involved in his training. And Sanders takes a page from the Blake book of the great Chicago Bear running back Walter Payton has Shawnee running up and down hills because that's what Walter Payton did to, to build up his legs up and down steep Mount Trashmore in Evanston, which he could do 20 times without stopping up and down, up and down. And he becomes the first individual African-American uh, gold medal winner in the Winter Olympics in speed skating. Uh, Bo Price, veteran in the Battle of Bulge, brings drill team to Evanston High School after World War II. Generations of young people of color say they owe their future to having taken part in the drill team, which wins seven national championships down through the decades. At Bo's funeral, Byron Wilson told the story of going to Bo's house and finding his wife crying. Why was she crying? Because Bo, who was a shoe repairman by trade, had pawned their furniture to take the drill team to compete. The descendants of Anthony Crawford never forgot what happened to the family patriarch, uh, Mr. Crawford back in Abbeville. So they get together with the descendants of Emmett Till and the descendants of Cheney Schwerner Goodman, the civil rights workers lynched in Mississippi in 1964 to lobby the United States Senate for an apology for not backing anti-lynching legislation when the president and house of representatives had done so, hundreds of bills down through the decades, always vetoed by the Senate. In 2005, the Senate formally apologized uh, this is the first formal American government apology for anything regarding slavery or lynching. And then in March of 2022, President Biden signed the Emmett Till anti-lynching law, which makes lynching a federal crime. So this is the Evanston living history, but it's a big part of uh, American history as well.
So I, I thank you for taking that journey with me. Um, and uh, Martin, if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of astounding to me that it took until President Biden to have yes. anti-lynching legislation. I, I, right. I, I never I never realized that we didn't have anti-lynching legislation until then. Yes, and it was the Southern senators you know, who had that power. See, one of the problems um, with denying Black people the vote in the South, well, then they get all sorts of seniority uh, mm -hmm. in key positions. They have these seniority, which enables them to have these powerful positions to block things like anti-lynching legislation. Mm -hmm. Because if Black people aren't voting, you're going to get the, the segregation vote. And right. so it's 1965 that... Um, and this is an interesting aside about uh, South Carolina. Dr. King went to Crabtree, South Carolina in 1966 to give a speech about the importance of registering to vote. And he, he talked about that the last black congressman from South, the last black con congressman was from South Carolina. And he gave a talk when he was leaving. And he said, um, this is a period of history that's come to an end. We have to go away for a while, but we will be back. Mm -hmm. And the next black congressman from South Carolina was actually a relative, James mm -hmm. Clyburn mm -hmm. uh, from, from Reconstruction. And of course, he would play a, a, a big role, you, would, you might say, in the, in the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's just, you know, that this, this is part of what goes into, you know, it's sort of if, if you keep black people from voting, it, it has a deep effect on all of the laws. And mm -hmm. so that's 1965. And, and then the apology comes in, in 2005. Wow. And it, that, and that still astounds me too, that it took until 2005 for an apology for a lynching that took place, what, well, over a hundred? The, the apology is for not backing anti-lynching legislation. Lynching legislation. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, Yes, we, we know Ida B. Wells was fighting for that back in 1898 with uh, yeah. President McKinley. Uh, but that's the stone wall of it. That's why Charles Hamilton Houston sidestepped the Congress and went mm -hmm. and fought those battles uh, in the Supreme Court, in the, through the courts. Mm -hmm. and, and they get the big decision, Brown versus Board of Education. It doesn't come you know, from the Congress, will be until 1964. Uh, that the that the civil rights legislation comes, but ten years before is Brown versus Board of Education, yeah, which is and, a big turning point. And and it's and it's amazing that that whole the beloved community that you were talking yeah. about um, through Martin Luther King and how um, how Crawford's children. I mean, just to see like through history how his descendants like really played into all of these different yes. elements. Yes, they did. That's that's right. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an important part of to, to see. You have to take a close look to see that. Mm -hmm. that that's an important part of the Black community. Um, you know, that fight for justice is at every level. And uh, that's the nonviolent, you know, that it's built on justice. Yeah. And I, and I have to say that people who are watching this are going to really appreciate that you gave Shawnee Davis a, a, a shout out because he was, he, oh. he trained in Marquette. I didn't Olympics. know that. I yes. didn't know yeah, that. He, You're the he, first. He, Good. Yeah. He trained at the Olympic Training Center here at Northern Michigan I University. I didn't know it. I didn't so, know it. Yeah. He was a, he was a huge presence here in um, Marquette and the surrounding areas. I mean, I remember several 4th of July parades where he was one of the one of the people in the Fourth of July oh, parade. I, that's why I love doing these programs. When I learned <laughs> this. I wish I could go. Sanders Hicks has since passed away, but I wish I could tell him that. To, now that's the connection to Anthony Crawford, because mm -hmm. Sanders is a direct descendant of Anthony Crawford's, and that tradition where you know Anthony Crawford had a school on his land. So Sanders starts the speed skating club for the young people. That doesn't happen. There is no Shawnee Davis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it does. It just doesn't happen. You know, a absolutely, and you know, and. Uh, uh, you know, Shawnee Davis, I mean, he was just a big name. He still is a big name yes. around here. They've got, sure. they, they've got um, like plaques and everything for him over at, yeah. um, at Northern Michigan University. But yeah, he was, um, uh, so, so the fact that 
Anthony Crawford's legacy stretches yes. all the way up yes. into the Upper Peninsula. Right. Um, it's just um, astounding. Oh, you made my evening with that. Uh, good to know. <laughs> good to know. Because it's not a, you know, that's not a name that just flies off for most areas, you know, that I will give this. But Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, anybody that um, is a longtime resident of Marquette oh, and, the, and nice. this area will know. Well, when you said Shawnee Davis, I was like, Oh, wow. And I've, I've met Sean, Shawnee Davis. So um, just yeah. a really, really, really nice guy. And um, yeah, that's what Sandra says in the film. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, so, so exciting. Yeah. Um, How interesting. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, uh, wow. I, I went that, that connection is just amazing. Well, because it, it speaks to the heart of everything we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The legislation on the one hand, but Dr. King puts it into a different perspective with the beloved community. Mm -hmm. If you have this community, we are helping the young people. It's built on justice where everybody has a chance. This is what comes, Shawnee Davis comes out of that, mm -hmm. you know, and you might think of it in terms of, well, purely of legislative terms, but this is the deeper <laughs> significance of everything that they're doing, you know, yeah. how it elevates all of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and um, wow, I, that that ju it just blew my mind when you when you started mentioning names and that and that one came up. I, you'll um, have to come see a, a pay homage to Mount Trashmore now. And I okay, never come here because <laughs> that's a, and see that it's a pretty steep hill that he went up and down, you know. And that, I filmed it for yeah. That that I, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, it's just because I um I I did see like. I, I I don't remember. It was when he was training here, and I saw because they had like speed skating trials for the Olympics here, and I and I saw him uh, like in in the uh, um, speed skating trials. I think that was the 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 trials where he actually went on to win the gold medal oh, um, God. that year. So yeah, Sanders said he cried. You mm -hmm. know, to think this little boy that he, you know, it's it's remarkable. You know, sometimes these these breakthroughs, these achievements are so remarkable. Mm -hmm. When you think of the odds, you know, yeah. that go against it, but out of this community. Um, and that's why, you know, they paid a big price. Mm -hmm. They paid a big price. You know, that's why it's, it's important for us to continue on in mm -hmm. that same spirit, you know, because who, what other little kid is out there, you know, exactly. that we might be able to help. You, you know, know like, it, and exactly, and it really is all about 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 community. Yes, I mean, I mean, uh, the, I mean, sure, sure. The Supreme Court eventually codified everything, and yeah. you know, and they came up with the anti lynching legislation that was signed into law. But if it hadn't been for all of the community that we're talking about, none of that would have kept would would have really happened. Then. The individual, you know, um, like Michael Schwerner. Cheney, mm -hmm. Schwerner, and Goodman. He was involved in core and young people in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. And he brought a group of young people down to Washington for the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. But it was what happened several weeks later, the bombing of the church in Birmingham mm -hmm. that really got to him. So then he had to go to Mississippi. He had to go and be part of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting when you look the civil rights legislation, the 1964 act did not pass until after the three it had disappeared in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it would have passed anyway, but did they play a role in that passing? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, James Reeb, the minister from Massachusetts who comes down to Selma and is killed. Ooh, President Johnson was ballistic that they killed this minister. Something in this, you know, what it, we don't know, but sometimes... Mm -hmm an individual can have a huge contribution mm -hmm. yeah. in these, these, these huge matters that, you know, it, it just, it's always at times something odd that tips it off, that tips mm -hmm. it over. Yeah. Know, that, and I, and I think that um, people really underestimate the power of one person being able to make you never a change. Know. You never know. Yeah. You, know, you just yeah. never know. Right? I mean, if anything that has taught us in the last few elections that we've had is yeah. one vote can make a huge difference and we don't anything. know till after the fact mm -hmm. i just feel and I, you know i can't do it scientifically that the floyd the killing of floyd you mm -hmm. know and it happened recorded by the phone 
you know, was a change in our society. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes this, the phone technology can produce that change. And I always felt uh, my father was in the news business that the films in, in, of Birmingham, when people saw the dogs and the fire hoses and it came to their mm -hmm. living room, yeah, you know, that produced, I mean, that had gone on, that kind of behavior had gone on, but this, some, this technology crosses paths with the people at that time and mm -hmm. something changes that's yeah. never going back, you know? Yeah, it's something that, it, it's something you can't ignore it anymore. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. just can't because it's right there in front of your eyes. And so you either, you either consciously make a decision, okay, I'm not going to deal with that. Right. It's not, it has nothing to do with me. Or you follow your conscience the way it should go. And yeah. you say, okay, something has to be done. Yeah. So, yeah. This is the ongoing battle for justice mm -hmm. in this remarkable unfolding, mm -hmm. you know, that we see play out. I'm old enough to remember going to the airport to pick up my father and hearing over the loudspeaker, well, Dr. Martin Luther King, please come to the white courtesy telephone. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and thinking, I could meet him. I mean, just think how it's changed. I mean, just in mm -hmm. terms of security, you mm -hmm. know, but just hearing that name, you know, and mm -hmm. that I was so close there that, that he was in that same, you know, that yeah. airport at that time. Uh, it, it, and all this has happened in my lifetime, with the mm -hmm. changes I've seen in my lifetime. Yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah. You know? I, I frankly, um, before Barack Obama was uh, elected president, I literally thought I would never live to see the day that an African-American was was elected yeah. president of the United States. Uh, I remember so. talking to the fire chief, Sanders Hicks, and he said, we didn't just, it wasn't possible. It just wasn't possible, mm -hmm. you know, but something at that moment in 2008, mm -hmm. you know, it just, um, it just happened, you know, they created um, that. And it's interesting because I was just reading about Carl Stokes in, in Cleveland, the first black mayor of a major city, mm -hmm. you know, what they, what Alice did in creating the, how it shifts, mm -hmm. the civil rights movement goes from protest to politics, and they start to build it from the ground up, you know, uh, politics, yep. and and then they elect Harold Washington, and Barack Obama just is, is uh, drawn to Harold Washington, I don't even know if they ever met, hmm. uh, but that whole organization brings him to Chicago in 1985, mm -hmm. and, and seeing that it's possible, and this really is from the ground up, it's not, you know, um, it's not just one figure on top. This is a whole movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and all of the things that Dr. King did to make that happen with Operation Breadbasket, mm -hmm. the forerunner where you're protesting in Chicago so that Black people will be hired. Now, here you have a city that's 30% 30, 30 Black, but people are not being hired. So what do they do? They boycott. They boycott the stores. Hmm. And as Alice said, the AMP is, is, is uh, I think, nine months or so boycotting, and the stock price goes down, and they start to hire Black people, but not just in, in the, you know, um, the lower levels. They also hmm. hire Black executives, and it's the Black executives that are going to fund the Harold Washington campaign. Mm -hmm. They're going to become the core of, of how he's funded. The Harold Washington campaign is going to have Black people at the forefront. It's going mm -hmm. to be funded by Black people. Black people running it. It's different. Mm -hmm. And this is what's going, Barack Obama is going to see all this. Yeah. And was it 27 Black women in Congress now? I heard that number. I, 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 think, I think that's the number. Yeah. Yes. I mean, this is, oh, you know, and if you listen to Corey Bush, you know, mm. she never thought you know, that she would be in Congress or, mm -hmm. so you're getting, you know, and we talked about Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. I, I, because these people that are put into government who have um, the, the experience of the, uh, the quote, ordinary person, and they're going to bring this sensibility. It brings something to our democracy that's very important. Yeah. And that's what's unfolding now. And as Dr. King, Dr. King said that, he felt that we were between two periods, what he called the coming world, which is the just world, mm -hmm. and the, the other world, which is the world of exploitation. And he said, when you're in between those two, you get all the turmoil. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We're going toward the just world, but we're in between them still. And that's where we have so much turmoil. Uh, but that's, you know, he believed that that's where we're, we're going. And, and that progression has been ongoing, has mm -hmm. not stopped despite, you know, all the, all the terrible turns. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it amazed me when I, when I watched Evanston's living history, in some ways you're the, those two films, the, the, the a film about Alice in some ways, I think like Evanston is the one that sort of leads up to, you know, then watching the story about Alice. Because well, that's the way so it happened. Closely connected. Because you know? I didn't know Alice. Alice's brother was the firefighter Sanders Hicks. Okay. And the only reason I met Alice was that she had photographs of her brother. Okay. And then I went to her apartment to film the photographs. And I saw there was things on the wall, interesting civil rights photographs, mm -hmm. but I still didn't put two and two together. And then she said, I have some things you might want to look at and we might be able to make a film, uh, you know, a, and then she, I saw in the letters, you know, from Harold Washington, Jimmy Carter, oh yeah. my gosh. And then it was her idea that we make this film because she said she liked the fact that I focused on what she called the ordinary people mm -hmm. in Evanston, not the the larger figures but the you know the people on the ground yeah. who made it happen and she wanted to call the second film alice's ordinary people mm. because she said it was the ordinary people in the civil rights movement you know that did all yeah. the work that were the yeah. backbone of it and and as we said before we started recording as we said it's that one person that just is in the right place at the right time doing the right thing yes that can, makes yeah. the difference like abraham lincoln yeah you know it's that, just a, it's amazing it, it is it is truly amazing because it's so easy to get heartbroken mm -hmm. you know of all the things in all the injustices but yet gandhi's line uh the miracle is that light exists in spite of all the dark mm. that's the miracle that these yeah. things do come out at yeah. these different times you know and um uh so we must continue to continually work at this this is a right. continue as alice said we've come a long way but there's still a long way to go exactly yeah and you know and i think that's a, a great quote to end on tonight okay. <laughs> thank you Mark. well i i really want to thank you craig this has been a real treat um and for talking... me too for the shawnee story thank no, you Mark. you're, thank you're you welcome so yeah absolutely um and, um, you know, just to do um, just to do justice to uh, Martin Luther King's memory and all the people that um, yeah. that um, marched behind him and made yes. him able to do what he did. And we have a Martin Luther King birthday as a national holiday. Yeah. I remember asking Alice, what would he have thought of all the things named? He, he said he never would have believed it. Because <laughs> at the time with his dance against Vietnam and all of that, you know, he just never would have believed it all. Of, yeah. You know, but it's so wonderful that we have a national holiday to honor yes. this great man. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Craig. Thank and you, um, and uh, uh, thank you everybody who's watching and are, are going to watch this. And um, this uh, this video will be available for about a week's time. So, and please um, go to um, Canopy. It's available through Peter White Public Library and um, view Craig's uh, two films, Alice's Ordinary People and Evanston's Living History, um, both available through Canopy and really, really wonderful. Thank you again, Craig. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Public Library. <laughs> thank you, Peter White Public Library, because this is how we've gotten these stories out through our public, our great public libraries. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our great public librarians. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night, Martin. Good night.